Hello, I'm Katie Stallard, Senior Editor, China and Global Affairs. And on today's New Statesman podcast, we'll be talking about Yevgeny Prigozhin's short-lived armed rebellion in Russia and what it means for the future of Vladimir Putin's regime. And who better to speak to than Vladislav Zubok, Professor of International History at the London School of Economics and the author of Collapse, the Fall of the Soviet Union. Vladislav Zubok, thanks for joining me. It's great to have you on the podcast. It's fantastic to be here. Thank you, Katie. The Build up to this crisis reminds me a little bit of the Hemingway quote about how you go bankrupt gradually and then suddenly. Um, it strikes me we've been watching this sort of long running feud building between Yevgeny Prigozhin, the leader of the Wagner mercenary group, and the Russian military leadership, specifically the defense minister, Sergei Shoigu, and the head of the general staff, Valery Gerasimov. That has been building up, it seems now, for months. But then all of a sudden, on Friday, 23rd of June, you had Prigozhin declaring his march on, of justice on Moscow and then taking control of a military base uh, in, in Rostov. If I can ask you to take me back to your impressions of the lead into this, of how we got here, and when you realized that what we were watching was in fact something pretty serious. Well, first of all, you know, I, I wouldn't pretend I wasn't caught by surprise. Well, generally, I, I teach history, I like history, but every time history catches me by surprise. I don't know. And not only me, of course. Uh, but when we try to understand what happened, we have to at least uh, speak about three uh, elements of this story. First, you know, sorry to be like a little bit professorial. Uh, first is the structure, the setting, the setting for it. Uh, second is contingency or conjunction, you know, what exactly, why exactly now? Why exactly at this moment? And of course, the actor himself, Prigozhin, and then and actors around him. So the setting was Vladimir Putin's strange mode of uh, waging this war. He didn't declare it a war. He didn't mobilize Russians. Uh, you know, there's some people think that. This is because uh, the uh, unsaid, unspoken assumption among the Russians is anything but war. We can forgive autocr autocracy. We can, you know, as long as the food on, on the table and, and there's no war. I mean, we can put up with this regime. <laughs> well, there's no war technically, but, you know, uh, those events uh, kind of uh, disrupted this. Second, second part of the setting is the fact that, that you know, Putin, like many autocrats, uh, of course, likes to manipulate many people uh, you know, to create this uncertainty. I mean, you know, Stalin famously or infamously played with his Politburo members. They never knew who's a favorite now, who would be the favorite tomorrow. And that, you know, the same concern, by the way, is Stalin's marshals, you know, for instance, they didn't know who would take Berlin in 1945, Zhukov or Konya. Fast forward to today's uh, situation, the same was, as you described, Katie, it was a long, long-term feud uh, between Prigozhin and uh, the top uh, military uh, leaders of the, actually, the regular army. And uh, people followed that feud uh, with fascination because Prigozhin clearly allowed himself much more than any Russian citizen, any Russian official could. I mean, that was a huge contrast between him blurting out all this, you know, um, you know, the truth about the war and everyone else who kept mum, including including Shoigu and, and Gerasimov, who sort of like sitting and getting all this wind in their face. Okay, so that was a situation and everybody thought, hmm, this is a kind of a game and this Putin knows about it, Putin tolerates it and, you know, as long as it goes. Now, why did it explode? Uh, and of course, it's the simplest uh, part of the story is that by July 1st, uh, Putin said, uh, you know, all formations, including most importantly Wagner, there are other formations, but they're minuscule, like battalions. But primarily Wagner, this private army, has to sign a contract with the Ministry of Defense and uh, be on state budget. It was on state budget, but it was on a special secret state budget before, but now it will be like everyone else. And uh, apparently that coincided with moves against Prigozhin personally. He is a wealthy man, you know, the cook of Putin. So suddenly that, that he heard that there would be raids on his property, that his business would be taken from him and so on and so forth. So 
Now we know, according to all the available information, that he simply freaked out. So he behaved like uh, no one else before him. I mean, what happened before him? Putin would take a property, I don't know, from Mikhail Khodorkovsky, put him, puts him into prison. All the other oligarchs, they did nothing. Uh, and that continued until today. Uh, Putin can humiliate anyone. Nobody, of course, reacts. Nobody responds because everybody knows the consequences. <laughs> Finally, you have this kind of freaky element, free element, like Prigozhin behaving strangely, freaking out. And then uh, after a while, maybe he calculated that his chances of success of actually, you know, what he was supposed to achieve in Moscow with 10,000 people in Moscow. A, storm the Kremlin and be annihilated. B, you know, throw out the rascals from the general uh, staff or the Ministry of Defense and be eliminated eventually. You know, what, what, what are the options when he calculated them gradually? He maybe calmed down and, you know, decided to, to take the deal that was coming his way. So all three things uh, caught us by surprise because of the last uh, uh, element in the, in the story, Prigozhin's character. Prigozhin's emotions, and I think that's the key in history. You know, some, you know, 10 other people in, uh, in Prigozhin's place would have just, you know, said, okay, Mr. Putin, okay, take my wealth, you know, I surrender, basically. But he did not, and uh, that, that's the story. This may be a failure of imagination on my part, but I, you know, the, the Friday night, the 23rd of June, with Prigozhin declaring he was going to do this, denouncing the basis for the war, I went to bed that night fully expecting to wake up and see Prigozhin under arrest or mm -hmm. maybe worse. Mm -hmm. My understanding was that somebody who, he was careful not to directly challenge Putin by name, but by going after so specifically the basis for the war, by going after that, you know, that quote, evil military leadership, it did seem like a fairly direct challenge to Putin's system. And I assumed he would be dealt with. And I was very surprised to wake up the next morning and see him there. He was strolling around the, the base in, in Rostov, chatting to the deputy defense minister, looking quite relaxed. Um, and his and his armored columns had, had reached Voronezh and they were still heading towards Moscow. I mean, what did you make of the official response to this? And the fact that, you know, as, as somebody put it to me, if you challenge Stalin and you lose, you lose everything. Right. Prigozhin sort of demonstrated you could challenge Putin, or at least elements of the system, and so far you seem to be able to walk away. Well, let's begin with Stalin, because not because he's my favorite historical personality, but it sort of sets these patterns of absolutely ruthless, absolutely kind of you know effective murderer and, and terror, and, you know, terrorized everyone. But but even Stalin did not kill uh, his his victim right away. There was this kind of Stalinesque pause famous pause. I mean, I can give many, many examples. One, you know, for instance, at, Yalta, at the Yalta conference in 45 with Roosevelt and Churchill, there was this marshal of aviation who blurted out something totally untoward and Stalin was offended by him. So the guy didn't disappear right away, but he eventually he disappeared. And that was Stalin's kind of signature. I think it's also Putin's signature in the sense that, you know, listen, you know, how for how many months, if not years, Alexei Navalny challenged him openly and basically ridiculed him. We all, you know, that was ages ago. It feels like ages ago, but you know, relatively recently he publicized all this stuff about Putin's palace you know, in the South, and everybody said, oh my God, how can dare to do it? What would happen to him? He, he, he was near poisoned, as we know, allowed, nevertheless allowed to go abroad and foolishly returned. And only then he was arrested and imprisoned because in a sense he cornered Putin. Putin had to do something. With Prigozhin, I don't think uh, Putin was uh, going to change this pattern of behavior. It just didn't expect to be caught flat-footed in such an unceremonious manner because he and Prigozhin, in a sense, are the opposites. Are the opposites. Putin is a calculator. He's a he's a web uh, man. He kind of slowly but surely makes this web, and ultimately, when no one pays attention, he strikes you know someone down, um, you know quietly. Uh, 
Uh, so Prigozhin is just the opposite. Look at him, you know, he all these uh, kind of tacky things with corpses around them, blurting out everything right now. He's a Twitter person. He's a kind of, you know, social uh, person. I mean, uh, I don't know where this background came from, from his imprisonment and, and his criminal background. I don't know, but he's totally opposite. And he, in this way, he gave us this drama of uh, how many, you know, 24 hours, basically, when he became the world sensation. And Putin, uh, who never goes on Internet, doesn't know what social networks is, you know, how they work. He operates, you know, in Stalinesque manner, basically, like in the previous century. He looked like totally dumb and ineffective but it's it's wrong because he's effective he just needs time he needs time and i'm sure you know he now met with the military he he he's uh he's uh, you know he's repairing his web as we speak right so he may be effective it's just in his own way putin mentioned the his reference point was the the 1917 mutiny when kornilov launched his own march then on, on, on St. Petersburg, or I guess then Petrograd. Um, and Putin made the link between this mutiny while the country was at war, and then the October Revolution and the Civil War that followed. What is the right historical analogy to be using here? What, what are the episodes of Russian history that can help us to think about and understand what we've just witnessed? Katie, I was so surprised when so many people uh, following P Putin's cue suddenly began to speak about another 1917. <laughs> well, I simply don't see any 1917 here. There's a, you know, the Tsar is not overthrown. And it's, you know, if we continue to discuss it, I think it's very difficult to overthrow the Tsar. He's still there in the Kremlin, right? Uh, there are no uh, radicals, uh, socialists, uh, idealists, and even kind of determined uh, enlightened bureaucrats uh, who are prepared to rescue the country and move, reshift it into the much more positive direction, unfortunately. And finally, you know, let, let's talk about the military. Uh, Russia was at war, World War I in 1917, was sort of losing this war, but with great allies. America joined the war in April. Some people say, had Russia not uh, succumbed to the revolution and radicalism, Russia would have been at the Versailles Conference. As, as, as one of the winning powers, right? So Putin definitely used this theme in, in his you know, historical analogy and so on and so forth. But let's talk about Kornilov. I want to defend Kornilov. People, when I was a student uh, in the Soviet communist days, they were taught, he's a white reactionary guy. He was a monarchist. I mean, not, nothing like that. He was a democratic general who wanted to clean the... Uh, you know, the capital from rascals and radicals and allow the Constitutional Assembly later on to take power and decide on the future of Russia. And later he proved he can die for his principles. He led another march against the Bolshevik mob in the south, actually not very far from where Prigozhin's camp was, and he died uh, heroically, right? So... Kornilov, uh, for many uh, Russians, uh, not only white Russians, but just n normal Russians, should be a hero, right? Prigozhin has no principles. Prigozhin is basically the way, particularly how he behaved by taking this deal and decamping to Belarus. I think he disappointed many people who are la almost on the brink of proclaiming him a new Napoleon, a new whatever, you know. And uh, some people wrote uh, on Twitter, you know, we should all support Prigozhin because he's the enemy of our enemy. Let him topple Putin. And he became the embodiment of so many aspirations and grievances. But he's none of that. He's none of that. He's just an unprincipled mobster, I think. And and at, at, at best, he could, a, a sort of communicator to some uh, some Russian millions who, uh, you know, liked his story. You know, let's show them we'll win. You know, we're tough. We're merciless. It is a certain cer certain public. And my 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 feeling is that instead of 1917, we should go to the early 17th century, so-called the time of troubles for Russia. You know, some call it the civil war. And you find plenty of characters during that time. It's, by the way, 1604 until the election of the new czar, the Romanov czar, 1613. 
a decade of total trouble, total economic chaos. And you find characters like Prigozhin there. Plenty. I mean, I wouldn't burden my uh, our, our listeners and viewers, you know, they uh, with all those names they would not recognize. But you know, reading this story, truly astounding. You find those pretenders. You find those ruffians who want to suddenly to march to Moscow and topple, um, you know, the uh, existing weak uh, czar in the hope to elect a people's czar and become the manipulator of the czar. So you find everything there. And, uh, you know, some great Russian historians actually said about this period, the early 17th century, it never fully left Russian political culture. It's still there. And even the Russian Revolution was compared to the time of troubles. Some historians wrote about 1917 through this lenses, not as we imagine revolution, right? A social, economic, some political transformation, but simply the collapse of authority and all, all kinds of rascals and entrepreneurs and pretenders moving in into this you know, vacuum and trying to uh, divide power or seize power. You said you didn't want to burden our listeners, listeners, but I would invite you to, to bur burden us further. I mean, for people who are less familiar, it, well, enlighten us, it would be the right word to use. For people who are less familiar with this period, what are the key characteristics and what did that look like for the power structure? What are the parallels that we can draw with the current moment? For those musical enough, I would uh, urge to, 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 to listen to uh, Boris Godunov, a famous opera. Uh, the 19th century with, you know, this uh, fantastic uh, plot of the, uh, you know, a desire that uh, was not accepted by Russian people as a true czar, Boris Godunov, uh, because Ivan, Ivan the Terrible killed his son previously and the dynasty ended, the, the last of, of uh, Ivan's sons, Fyodor, was feeble-minded as the chronicle a chronicle has wrote about him and he left no uh, progeny, no successors. So the dynasty ended. But then Russia was uh, so weakened by Ivan the Terrible's follies, by constant wars, by the way, with Poland uh, in the Baltics, uh, by all these raids from Crimea, you know, the Ottoman Empire. <laughs> it's familiar geography, but different, you know, of course, different situation. Um, that, you know, economically, uh, socially and psychologically, People just uh, were prepared, in a sense, for, the, for, 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 for accepting anyone who could fix that problem. But then the, the, the issue of legitimacy kicked in in a big way. In a big way. You may find it really, really strange. You know, how in, 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 a, in a monarchy, a uh, Russian type of monarchy, uh, legitimacy may matter. It mattered hugely. Because in, in the eyes of the people, there could be the right czar and the fake czar. And of course, then that emerged, a pretender emerged, uh, famously called False Dmitri, who uh, was a monk or, or some guy who pretended to be a monk. Uh, and then the story, the fantastic story starts. I mean, when you begin only to read this narrative, you cannot stop. He found the backing of the Polish-Lithuanian uh, you know, magnates, wealthy people. They said, go, we'll give you money, we'll give you troops marched to Moscow and seized power from Tsar Boris. And then the hell broke loose. Boris died. Uh, this guy entered the Kremlin, you know, everything ch chimed, people meeting him as a true Tsar because he said, I'm the last, uh, grand I'm the last grandson of Ivan the Terrible. I'm the loyal Tsar. Of course, he was not. So very quickly, the cast changed. Next act, he's, he's thrown out uh, of, of the window, defenestrated. You know, one of the Boyar clan seized power, Vasily Shulsky. You know, people don't like him. He's not a true czar either. And that kind of mess continued for 10 years. And Russia practically ceased to exist as a sovereign state, lost territory to the Swedes in the north, to the Poles. You know, and finally, the Polish troops ended up in the Kremlin. I, I, I don't know. The Poles remember it, I'm sure, in their history books. It's one of the proudest moments. They were sitting in the Kremlin in Moscow for a few months. So Russia was finished. Russia was finished, and uh, nobody knows what happened, but uh, Russian people probably rallied around the idea of a true czar, and, and that proves something interesting. When Russia, let's say, loses a war, people, and when the czar is weak, and people say, that's it, 
that's over. Russia is over. But that, they forget about legitimacy and they forget about, and the elites, by the way, the elites are quite, quite accommodating, scheming and corrupt. They're prepared to invite the Polish czar. They prepare to make all kinds of deals at the expense of their own country. They're absolutely cynical and unprincipled. But people come in defense of a true religion and mother Russia. And that's, this is what at least nationalist historians later on wrote about this lesson of the time of trouble. So in the end, they elected Michael, little, uh, little, still young, you know, Misha, Michael Romanov as the next star. And we, we had the Romanov dynasty until 1917, right? So the upshot is, is that it was a Russian way of repeating the English civil war when you know Thomas Hobbes wrote his Le Leviathan as a result of a civil war of everyone against everyone, finally you needed Leviathan for some kind of a, a deal between the main elements of the society. So in 1913, uh, the elites, the Russian people, and uh, elected the Tsar, and this triangle was established. And this triangle lasted until 1917, I would say. So for me, it's much more relevant story for what we're watching today. Uh, like in uh, 1604, when the pretender false Dmitri appeared on the horizon, the elites and the people hate each other and mistrust each other. I mean, the first thought probably when Prigozhin was marching into Moscow among many officials was, hey, this guy comes and unleashes the mob against us. They will rob us. They will take over our estates. They will take over our luxury cars, Bentley, the Bentleys, the Maseratis. I don't know, the modern version of, of the luxury. They would prepare probably to make any deal with anyone at this brief, brief, brief moment. So now, of course, they, they are all over the place, the Russian Duma, uh, representatives say we must look at who behaved, how at this moment did they buy tickets to leave Moscow? I mean, what did they do? And that's really a reaction to their be typical behavior. Uh, they did the same in 1604, 1605, betraying Tsar Boris, then betraying the pretender false Dmitri, then pretending his successor Shuisky. Anyway, but the people uh, didn't have a word in this story because it, la it, it lasted literally a few hours, right, Katie? So when, people, when we make any conclusions about what would be the outcome of, of all this, let's suppose Prigozhin goes all the way. He's in Napoleon, he marches, and you know what would happen to the Wagnerites in the streets of Moscow? I think people would just look at them with astonishment, alienation, they would not greet them as, as liberators. They would not support them as someone who would, came to topple Putin and install a new czar. They would just go by their business. And, uh, you know, Wagnerites in Rostov, they were lost. They were sort of went to local cafes and <laughs> bought cafes and <laughs> didn't know what to do next. The same would have probably happened in Moscow. So, you know. You wrote a terrific piece for the New Statesman um, in response to this, where you talked about how... Prigozhin's mutiny had punctured a hole in the performative Russian reality. And through this gaping hole, we can see a looming catastrophe. Very unfair question to ask a historian, I know, but where do you see this heading now? But it's, it cut both ways, Katie. You know, when I said, uh, I, I really meant it, uh, you, you, this, this thing was real. Uh, and for a moment, everyone saw uh, a, a prospect of a civil war, like on the famous Dali painting, right? Uh, the nation killing each other. They saw a social upheaval. They saw possibility of Putin being, you know, toppled, whatever. Uh, they saw uh, the possibility of hyperinflation when the ruble would lose its value as a result and would, would be worth a pile of money. Uh, and that was just for a brief moment. But again, it cuts both ways. On, on one side, it's sort of people say, wow, you know, Putin can be toppled. He performed so weakly. He was uh, briefly like that clown telling about 1917, but not doing anything, threatening only and so on and so forth. Nobody did a thing. That's all true. And that is, that is what we read most of the time in all Western and publications and comments. But there's a, the other side of the coin is that, um, you know, the actors of the story are Russian elites 
and um, you know, passively even Russian people who you know have to make their choices to cheer, not to cheer, you know, to smile, not to smile, even passively, right? So when they see this gaping hole through which catastrophe looms, they decide, oh hell no, oh, I want my children to go to kindergarten and school tomorrow. I want my pension and my ruble to stay stable. Hey, you know, I, I may think that Putin is old and absolutely dysfunctional, but but you know, I would prefer him to stay rather than to have any any, any anybody like Prigozhin or just the pr prospect of Prigozhin and somebody else fighting over uh, the seat in the Kremlin. Uh, oh my God, you know, I'm not sure how many millions read and reread uh, you know the history of the, of the time of troubles during those hours. Smuta is called in Russian. But, you know, instinctively, because they have this kind of almost like genetic instinctive memory of their history, they reacted, I think, in, in this way. So if we have a second chance, and it's quite likely that the war continues and such chances may, such moments of instability might happen again with shock and, you know, uncertainty, um, we have, we analysts, have to take both sides of the coin. Yes, Putin may be punctured as a, not, you know, as a naked king, right? At the same time, uh, he's not the only actor. He's viewed as the only factor that holds the country and the order together. And that gives him resilience, even beyond his own personal capacities. That gives him sort of a mandate if he loses completely this mandate, then people would spit and say, you know, okay, we expected him at least to do this and that, and he didn't even do this and that. But we still haven't reached this moment. Vladislav Zubok, thank you so much for joining me today.